Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sri's daily global COVID-19 show. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and it's my honor to convene this daily conversation around all things COVID. We discuss three crises on this show, the health, financial, and racial inequality crises. We're always looking for guests and theme suggestions. Please email me, sri at sri.net. S-R-E-E -E at S-R-E-E dot -E Tonight, we have a very special show for you. You get to meet Simon Tam, author, musician, speaker, troublemaker, relentless fighter for justice, world record 13 TEDx talks, and founder of The Slants, who won their case against the U.S. Patent Office at the Supreme Court in Matal versus Tam. How many folks do you know who have a Supreme Court case named after them. You know one now. Please follow him on Twitter at Simon the Tam, S-I-M-O-N-T-H-E-T-A-M. Please follow him and connect with him. You'll meet him in just a minute. We're live on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, on LinkedIn, and we want you to share this with your friends and family. Tag them. We know it's a Saturday night in America, but tag your friends, they can watch later. We have folks watching from around the world, and we're grateful for all of you for being here. Hi, everybody. I'm Sri, and I'm grateful to all of you. I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism. I'm also the co-founder of Digimentors, a social, digital, and virtual events consulting company. Our motto is very simple. Don't cancel or postpone your event until you talk to us. Help us help you make your virtual event come to reality. And don't even think about it without talking to us first. You see my email address right on the screen, sri at sri.net. If you're new to us here, we want to tell you a little bit about this show. This is our stats after the first 125. We had a million plus viewers, 88 million social impressions, 234 guests from 48 cities in 13 countries, and that was 11 shows ago. We've had doctors, nurses, authors, journalists, musicians, CEOs, founders, teachers, professors, but the first time today we have a Supreme Court case winner who has his name on a Supreme Court case. We are brought to you in partnership with scroll.in, one of India's leading news, information, culture websites. Check out scroll.in. And you can find all our archives at youtube.com slash Srinet. Our producers are Rose Horowitz at Rose Horowitz 31 and Vandana Menon, Vandana underscore Menon. Please tag them, please follow them, and please see the incredible work they've done. We've been live for 136 straight days. One, three, six. It's sometimes hard to believe that that's even possible. We haven't taken a single day off. Someone I know congratulated me on my work thinking this is my full-time job. This is a full-time job, but where it is not, we are able to do this because of the support of all of you. And to everyone who said that this show has been a lifeline, for everyone who said this show has been helpful to you, you should know that this show is my lifeline and this show is helpful to me. To have thousands of people every night tune in and be together has been very, very special. We're going to thank our sponsors, and then we're going to bring on Simon. In the meantime, let me tell you about the show we did last night. We did a show on Netflix, Indian Matchmaking, and oh my God, it was a crazy night for a crazy show. We had Smriti Mundra with us, executive producer of the show, and Oscar-nominated director of St. Louis Superman. And Vyasar Ganeshan was with us. He was on the show, and people loved him in Netflix's global hit, a top 10 show on Netflix. We have other great shows coming up this week. Tomorrow night is Positivity Night, where we try to be positive if we can, and our guest is Jamie Metzel, founder of One Shared World, technology futurist, geopolitics expert, and sci-fi novelist. Please join us. We call it Positivity with an asterisk because we're trying to be positive despite every rotten thing happening in the world. And then on Monday night, we go back to Portland in crisis. This time we meet Bernie Foster, publisher of The Scanner, the leading 
publication for African American folks in the Pacific Northwest. He will be with us as well as other guests. So please tune in 9 p.m. on Monday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. in Portland. We did a similar show earlier this week and had a terrific response on a very problematic situation. As you know, federal officials, federal stormtroopers, federal troops are going into Portland and are in the middle of attacking peaceful protesters. And we want, we talked about that and we'll be talking about it again on Monday night. All right, let's thank our sponsors because without the sponsors, we would not have a show. So first we wanna thank Muckrack Academy for creating the resources for me to create fundamentals of social media, a free certification course for anyone who wants to get better at social media. More than 4,000 people have taken it and you get a certificate at the end of it, mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social. Please take a photo, share this with your friends. You know someone who wants that this course, who needs this course, please share this with them. We also want to thank our friends at the other show we do, She's On Call. This is a show starring my good friends, Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar and Dr. Marina Kurian. And they look at what's happening in the world of medicine and health, and they have an entire back to school episode running tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern. Dr. Heather Kloss will be here, an infectious, infectious diseases doctor at Temple. Dr. Sally Goza will be here, the president of the American Acad Academy of Pediatrics. Think about that, folks, how amazing that you'll get to speak to her and to Dr. Donna Ma and, and registered nurse Donna Mazik, who is the executive director of the National Association of School Nurses. I can't think of a more timely show, 11 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow at She's On Call. One more show to tell you about, our Every Sunday, we read aloud the Sunday New York Times for five years like crazy people. And tomorrow, we'll be reading it out at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. Anthony De Palma, legendary New York Times reporter, writer, foreign correspondent, with a focus on Latin America, Mexico, and Cuba. That's 8.30 a.m. Eastern. And we have two more ads for you, and then we're done. A new sponsor for us, Nunbelievable, divinely delicious cookies on a mission. Each box of handcrafted cookies provides two meals to those in need. So please take a look. You get 20% off with the code SRE, S-R-E-E, 20% -E, off. Please sign up at nunbelievable.com. Divinely delicious cookies on a mission. Each box of handcrafted cookies purchased provides two meals to those in need. And our final sponsor for tonight is here. Start Premier Nights. Watch the year's biggest blockbuster streaming straight to your screen, exclusively on Hot Star. Hot Star Premier Night kicked off this weekend with the world premiere of the new film Dil Bechara, starring the late Shushant Singh Rajput, with new music from Oscar winner A. R. Rahman, streaming free on the platform right now. Hot Star brings you the newest Indian movies with subtitles, plus entertainment, cricket, live news channels and much more, hotstar.com slash US. Make sure that you or anyone who loves Indian entertainment have a chance to check out Hotstar, and this film is now available free at hotstar.com slash US. All right, are you ready for Simon Tan? Simon's gonna be with us in just one minute. There you see Simon's author, musician, speaker, troublemaker, relentless fighter for justice, world record 13, TEDx Talks, founder of The Slants, who won their case against US Patent Office at the Supreme Court in Matal versus Tam. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is, my friend, the incredible Simon Tam. Hi, Simon. Hey, so good to see you. Great to see you. Thank you for being here. My first question to every guest is, how are you? Where are you? How's your family doing through this crisis? 
I think it's a complicated question. Uh, it, it seems like these days, um, the how are you question always has all these kind of contingencies. But um, for the most part, I'm, I've been doing pretty well here. I'm in the middle of moving uh, from Nashville, Tennessee to Cincinnati, Ohio. So things have been a little bit chaotic, a little bit busy, but um, but things on, on the whole are, are doing pretty well. Well, we're glad, glad to hear that. Uh, tell us one thing about Nashville that uh, people would be surprised to know. Uh, it's not all about country music, <laughs> and it's um, it's actually a little bit more diverse than than one would think. Uh, I you know a lot of people have all kinds of stereotypes about the South, but um, it's actually a very very lovely place with extremely friendly people, and it, it's quite diverse in both in taste of its uh, the taste of music as well as its people. That's great. And so, what's taking you now to Cincinnati? Well. Um, more affordable living <laughs> for one, but also because I'm going to be joining an organization called Strive Together. It's an organization that kind of coaches and convenes uh, best practices with nonprofits across America to provide uh, better racial equity ac outcomes as it comes to serving children in, in public education. That is so important that you're doing that very timely. So how can people find more out about this? You can go to strivetogether.org to learn more information about what the organization is doing. And I think at this time, it couldn't be any more timely. I mean, there's so much happening in terms of the conversations that people are having and how do we serve students in the midst of the COVID, um, like what schools ought to be doing and how the practices of whether to open or not, how they can disproportionately impact families by, by race as well as by um, at their economic levels. So we're doing some really, really amazing work in that area um, and sharing a lot of best practices and elevating the stories of people who are impacted, who oftentimes don't get to have their voices heard. Yeah, thank you for doing that. I'm, I'm so glad to hear it. Uh, tell us a little bit about your own work in Nashville. How did you decide that this is the right moment to move on and, and uh, take up this, this uh, great new challenge you're taking on? Well, uh, I mean, Nashville has been great. It's uh, like I said, it, I've really enjoyed living here for the past several years. Um, but, you know, as I was kind of looking at opportunities and thinking about kind of um, that next step in my career, and as there's just been this um, incredible momentum in, in terms of the conversation around racial justice in America, I realized that I, I just wanted to find more of a, a role where I could jump in and kind of be more active in, in terms of using my experience, my skills, and, and kind of like all the connections I've built over the years. You know, obviously I've spent a lot of time touring and speaking on behalf of my band, The Slants, and we focused a lot in that intersection of arts and activism. And I thought, well, where else can I lend use to these, uh, all, everything I learned and what kinds of organizations are out there? Well, that's when I discovered Strive in, in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I thought this would be a perfect fit. So that's kind of what uh, brought on the change. And um, I'm really excited. Cincinnati is a, an amazing city. It's uh, it's thriving and growing. And so uh, I also got to say, I miss decent dim sum because Nashville, we don't have any. <laughs> no, no dim sum restaurants in all of Nashville, but terrific other kinds of food. I I know that I've, the closest I've gotten to Nashville is Chattanooga. I was there on February 6th, um, 6th or so. One of my last trips will now, I hope, last for now, right? I hope in 2020, uh, yeah. one, I'll be able to travel again. And if I do, I'll be able to say that I went to some other place other than Chattanooga uh, uh, as my one of my recent trips. And uh, I actually had a great time in Chattanooga. The, the food was terrific. And everybody said, you've got to go to Nashville and Memphis, and I, I, they're on my list, and I hope to get there yeah. one day. Chattanooga yeah. is, is, is incredible. It, it's, it's a lovely place. But I will say that uh, if your travels take you to Cincinnati, please let me know. I would be more than happy to host you there. Well, we'd love to uh, We'd love to come. I've been to Cincinnati, and it's a place that kind of looms large if you were a young kid growing up in America in the early 80s because of WKRP in Cincinnati, <laughs> and the, 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 station, the show and the theme song was something i always remembered and i went back and watched the show on uh on youtube and such and i was like i can't remember what the exact fascination was what there were fascinating characters in there 
and they were a media company. It was WKRP was, a, I guess, a fictional radio station in Cincinnati. And uh, we, we also, one of the things you'll learn is how close Cincinnati and Kentucky are. Basically, the airport is in, uh, in Kentucky, isn't it? Yeah. The other I mean, way around. Yeah, yeah. In, in fact, it's uh, so close to the town that's right on the other side, um, Covington, Kentucky, where I actually have a, a little rental property there. We can actually walk to, to Cincinnati, just cross the footbridge and takes about 10 minutes and you're in a whole other state. So Nice. So let's tell us what we're looking at here. This is the website of your band. So let's talk about that first and tell us uh, your, about your colleagues. So this this is uh, the slants. Um, a lot of times people call us the world's first and only all Asian American dance rock band. It's a group that I started in uh, 2006. I can't believe it's been that long. Um, but it was a passion project of mine where we got to just, um, you know, write and perform music that kind of reflected our um, shared ethnic background, we, you know, as being all Asian Americans, we kind of had some similar experiences growing up, even though each of us grew up in very different circumstances and places across the country. We also were kind of bound together by the, by this idea of like having pride for our identity. You know, when we started in 2006, this is before Facebook or uh, YouTube had its prime, everyone was on MySpace, and it was so difficult to find any Asian American artist because it certainly no one was really in the mainstream media that we decided to kind of put ourselves out there and to provide a bold portrayal of our culture. And so our touring and music over the years have kind of really involved uh, both the music aspect as well as a certain degree of activism. So we, we're so blessed to partner with a lot of incredible social organizations over the years, um, doing everything from joining President Obama's campaign to end bowling against Asian American students to uh, raising money to bring more awareness about the disparity rates that Asian American women face when it comes to cancer. And I didn't even, I was not even aware of that, that second campaign. I knew of the work you had done about bullying. So it's uh, great to know about that. So let's uh, tell everybody about uh, the other two gentlemen. So the uh, lead singer, Ken Shima, he's the gentleman on the left in that particular photo. Uh, he's an incredible Japanese American singer who came to us through the wor world of uh, musicals, actually. He went to college specifically to study the arts and uh, his dream was to perform in musical theater. Uh, what ended up happening, he went to LA, joined a theater, but um, learned that oftentimes that door was closed to him before he even had a chance to jump on stage. Because if you want to audition for roles like uh, Fan of the Opera, uh, Les Mis, and they see an Asian face, oftentimes there aren't any roles for you. Um, you know, he couldn't actually play characters unless he was in excessive makeup to cover up who he was. And so with that kind of experience, he, he returned back to Portland, Oregon, um, just wanting to find something where he didn't feel like he had to hide. And so he actually joined my band at the time, which uh, was looking for a new lead singer. Uh, the gentleman on the right is uh, Joe Jang. He's uh, my guitarist and kind of my main collaborator, especially these days. We've been writing a lot of songs and performing together. Um, the band has kind of retired a bit. Like we, we've started playing long, uh, long tours in terms of like a full band experience. But Joe and I have been touring across the country, playing acoustic shows. Uh, he almost always joins me whenever I do speaking at events because I like to incorporate live music into my talks. And so he's been a, an amazing collaborator. And then all three of us now are actually a part of a new nonprofit that we started called the Slants Foundation, where we kind of work to provide resources and mentoring to Asian American artists who want to incorporate activism into their work. So those who've kind of pay attention to the world of Asian American culture know that uh, during COVID-19, there's been an unprecedented level of attacks against Asian Americans, uh, all kinds of um, physical violence and discrimination. And so on top of that, artists have suffered greatly under the pandemic, losing out on their main sources of income, like performing. And so we decided to put together a series of grants to help support the artists who are um, creating great work that wanted to counter hate using art. So in other words, creating artistic works, be it music or poetry or uh, a visual art to basically evoke compassion and to spark discussions about our cultures instead of um, things that simply 
call people out and provoke anger and defensiveness. I'm seeing on your site, theslats.com, we're seeing our core values include amplify underrepresented voices, especially those among the Asian American community, focus on controversial and timely issues through social justice lens, challenge con conventional thinking in terms of creating social change. So that'll bring us up to the name. Let's talk about the name. Let's get that out of the way. I can see people in the comments are losing their minds a little bit. So uh, even I sometimes hesitate when I tell your story because of the name itself. And it's sort of timely that we're talking because we're in the middle of talking about names and names that need changing, like the Washington football team. So we'll, we'll, we'll get to that, but let's talk first about the slats. What is the name? I mean, we can all guess the, the origin of the name, but tell us the story of the name and how the heck you ended up in the Supreme Court with a court case named after you. Sure. So the name actually started because I was having a conversation w w with some of my white friends in Portland. I said, you know, I knew I wanted to start this band. And, and one, uh, I, I wanted to start this band about uh, that celebrated Asian American culture. So I started asking him, I said, what's something you think all Asian people have in common? And uh, almost all of them said the same thing. Uh, they said slanted eyes, which I thought was interesting because you know, that was one of the main things that got me bullied as a kid. I was constantly attacked uh, verbally, emotionally, physically uh, for having these eyes, for having this face. And I knew because Asian Americans are some of the most bullied kids in America that they that there were other people who shared that experience as well. And I always associated my eyes with a sense of shame and embarrassment. So I thought, what if we injected pride into this? What if we flipped the stereotype around and instead took control of that conversation? So that's when the idea for the slants was born. We thought this could be a, a term that we could use as a sense of empowerment instead. Uh, you know, this is something that artists have been doing for, for many, many decades. And we certainly weren't the first people to use slant in this kind of reappropriated manner. Uh, we just have to be the first like rock and roll band to do so. And so that was kind of the, the genesis behind that, that people shouldn't be afraid or ashamed of, of their the shape of their eyes and that we can use this as kind of a springboard to have these more nuanced discussions on race. So for example, when people would ask me, um, you know, if they got a little uncomfortable with the name, they would say like, well, why is that the name of your band? It, it, it'll kind of gave me a doorway to say, why do you feel uncomfortable with talking about this? Um, you know, why, why is this the racial stereotype that you think of? Why do you think of Asian Americans when, it, like, it, why is it an issue for Asians to use this name, but say a uh, non-Asian band? Most people wouldn't even think of it being an issue. So it really kind of generates a lot of provocative discussions about race, identity, who gets to control language, and, and so on. And then how did you, so tell us the, the, the way you ended up in the Supreme Court. How did that go from the name? to where you, where you ended up in the Supreme Court. And folks, if you're just watching, I'm sorry to make uh, him so much smaller there. Uh, uh, please uh, tag your friends, uh, meet, tell them that you they should meet Simon. Even if they can't join us now, they can join us later. Please tag, we're live on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and on LinkedIn. He's at Simon the Tam on Twitter. And uh, you can find us on all four platforms right now, and they can watch it later. Uh, Simon is a, a good friend. A couple of years ago, when I wanted to teach people how to speak in public, I asked Simon to uh, teach us, and he came to do a workshop called Rock the Mic, and he rocked that uh, event. We had such a great time. And then a year later, we found ourselves in the most unusual kind of mix of people at a uh, First Amendment conference uh, in Pittsburgh, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, it, it had right-wing people, us. It had uh, uh, people who had been uh, who had gotten in trouble for just speaking uh, their truths, and it was a it was a fascinating day-long conference. And Simon was one of the headliners and was uh, was performing. And I had such a great time. We was there with our friend Liza Donnelly, the New Yorker cartoonist. We had a great time. So uh, Simon's going to tell us the story how si the the name Simon Tam became. Uh, part of a Supreme Court case uh, that a case, court case that eventually became a Supreme Court case, and how they won that. So, Simon, I'm going to give you extended time to tell us that story. 
I'll try and compress the eight years into something a little more uh, compact than that. Uh, so basically, we had been performing as the slants for a couple of years, uh, working with a number of um, racial justice organizations across America, kind of doing anti-bullying work and that sort of thing. And around that time period, it was actually kind of after we were, uh, we appeared on NPR's All Things Considered. Like they did this huge profile story talking about um, our ban, which was turning st stereotypes about Asian Americans upside down. And uh, around that time period, uh, I became friends with an intellectual property attorney who says, you know what, Simon, you should register uh, your trademark. Like the slants uh, should be a registered trademark because this is something that's normal for artists to do. I didn't really think a whole lot about it. I was just like, sure, I, I guess I'll trust you. Uh, so we applied. A couple of months later, we got a response from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. The examining attorney uh, had actually rejected our application. And they said it was because of an out, you know, this old law called Section 2A of the Lanham Act that basically says you can't register trademarks that are considered scandalous, immoral, or disparaging. But it's not just what anyone considers to be disparaging. They say that they have to find what's called a substantial composite of the reference group to uh, deny a registration under the name. And so as I was talking to my attorney, I was like, who did they find who was actually offended by this? And he says, no one. And I'm like, what do, what, wait, what do you mean no one? You just told me that the law says they have to find like a whole bunch of people. He says, no one, uh, but they did quote urbandictionary.com, which is uh, for those not familiar, it's a wiki joke website. And of course I was like, you gotta be kidding me. And so we decided to fight this thing. We challenge it and we fought in the traditional way that anyone who was refused a registration under this law would fight. We provided numerous examples, um, mostly testimonies from our, our community. So um, national Asian American leaders stood up on our behalf. Many organizations, we demonstrated how every single Asian American newspaper, TV show, radio show, blog, and podcast in the country supported our use of the name. And on top of that, how we were doing anti-racism work on behalf of the US government. Well, they doubled down and they continued to uh, reject it. So finally we said, hold on a second, why us? Why, if, if slant is this inherent racial slur that you claim it is, how come um, you gave it to 800 other people? You see, everyone else who applied for, the, for some kind of trademark on slant got it. So we were like, what's the problem with this band? And that's when the government told us it was because we were too Asian to use the, the trademark. In other words, they said, if, if you look up the words, uh, the slants, and you see a bunch of Asian faces, you're going to automatically think racial slur instead of any other definition in the dictionary, which is basically a more convoluted way of saying anyone could have registered the slants as long as they were not Asian. So in the name of fighting against racism, they denied us our rights because we were Asian. And so uh, we decided to combat using the, the strongest kind of argument you can in this country, which is a constitutional argument that led us to the federal courts where we won uh, kind of a astounding victory. And um, even after that, the government continued to press that fight. They sued, uh, took me to the Supreme Court where we went before um, the justices in the highest court of the land. And at the United States Supreme Court, they ruled unanimously in our favor, saying that uh, the law actually was violating my First Amendment rights, so freedom of expression. Um, and it became this kind of a wonderful uh, kind of spark to have all these conversations about racial quality, who gets affected and how are they affected by our laws and also where that role of freedom of speech lies when it comes to things like trademarks. Um, you know, you, earlier uh, you mentioned kind of one of the more high profile cases and that's of the Washington football team uh, because there is certainly a lot of uh, controversy there. Um, you know, a number of incredible Native American activists were filing to try and get their trademark registrations canceled and using the same law. So it just shows how the, the law itself can be kind of complex, used in a lot of different ways, both to harm and protect people. Thank you. I'm looking at this photograph here. Tell us about that day. Was it a single day? Was it multiple days? Uh, what was it like to go to the Supreme Court 
And normally when we see photos of the Supreme Court, it's like lots of signs and crazy stuff going on. Yeah. Uh, what was it like that day? Was there other more, bigger show, bigger shows, not shows, bigger cases on the docket? What was going on and what was going through your mind as you were dealing with everything? I don't know if this photo was taken that day, but about it, the day. It was taken that morning, uh, okay. early. Uh, it was surreal. I, I mean, it's just the weirdest experience. So um, what's not shown in this particular photo is there was um, a line to get in that was several blocks long. Uh, and you know those DC blocks are not by any means small. And in fact, there were people who had lined up since midnight the night before to try and get into the arguments on our case, uh, because our, our case that year was one of the most talked about cases uh, that the Supreme Court heard. Uh, that particular day, I mean, I was just filled with nerves, even though I was not the one arguing and in no way was I able to argue. I, I was just so tied to, to this case. I mean, I had been fighting for eight years. So there was a lot of like personal feelings about it. And it's kind of funny because um, you kind of have these ideas of what it's going to be like in the courtroom. And I think it's kind of driven by all the movies we see. You, you know, you see, you imagine someone who's just like passionately arguing, like, but you don't understand, this is the truth. Uh, and somehow and somewhere that passion gets through. And I remembered for, for years leading up to that point, I would have dreams, I would fantasize about that. Like maybe one of the justices would recognize that it was me and say like, hey, what do you have to say? And I would get up and say all the things that I wish I could say, all the things that can't be contained in a legal document that aren't necessarily like legal arguments, but they're moral ones, they're ethical ones and, and what ought to be done. Of course, uh, that didn't happen. <laughs> um, that, I mean, that's just the way things are. But just so that people people understand that uh, you can't like in you can always speak for yourself in a criminal defense law, a law uh, case, right? Here, right. there's a you have to be admitted to the bar at the Supreme Court to be able to speak, and you there was no way you could have argued this even if you had wanted to. Is that correct? Correct, and, and that's the irony of it. I'm like fighting for freedom of speech in the nation's highest court and in that room i cannot say a thing and it, it, i think it's symbolic in so many ways of like how how our laws sometimes don't necessarily serve those most affected in fact there's this kind of like weird interaction i had because we walked into that courtroom fairly early they wouldn't actually let us sit near the attorneys um there's like you know the attorneys are arguing from two tables right up by the diocese where the, where the justices sit. Behind them are rows and rows of chairs that they reserve only for people admitted to the bar of the Supreme Court. So mostly like lawyers and law professors and the like. After that are rows and rows of pews. Uh, we get seated in the second row of those pews, but like as people are filing in, they see four young Asian guys in suits sitting up front. So they're like, oh, this must be the band. And all this whispering happens, you hear finger pointing, all this commotion before court's in session. And so someone signals for the court martial, and they're like, hey, hey, um, and they point to me and they're like, this is Tam of the case being argued today. This is the Tam. Doesn't he at least get to sit in the front row of this section? And he says like, oh, I gotta go check with the Solicitor General. That's the highest ranking attorney in the country. The, sol the Solicitor General is who we're arguing against that day. So he leaves, 10 minutes later, he comes back, he looks at me and he says, I'm sorry, sir, but we're reserving the seat in case someone important shows up today. <laughs> and I was just like, oh my, like, that's just, what he just did there was the perfect illustration of how I've been feeling for almost a decade, trying to fight this thing, trying to fight for the dignity of, of just being able to choose what's right for my own self, for my own community to have a stake in that conversation. But never in that entire time could we have, because, you know, that's the funny thing. The government kept saying, oh, you're offensive to Asian people, you're offensive to Asian people. But never once did they bother talking to a single, like they didn't talk to a single Asian organization about it. In fact, nearly every major um, Asian American legal entity in the country filed am uh, amicus briefs in support of my case. So it was like, if you actually looked at the surveys, if you did the talk to academic uh, prof professionals and activists, they would all say that they were in our corner. So how could you make these claims? 
But of course, like kind of mentioned with uh, with my not being able to represent myself, our entire community was not able to represent myself uh, ourselves. You had uh, every single justice and all the attorneys making these arguments and talking about what was offensive to Asian people, and the only Asian people in the room were not allowed to say anything about the matter because they knew better. You know, I've I've talked to you multiple times, but we've never heard this in detail. It's so fascinating. Uh, set the scene for us. Who who are the nine justices there that day? Or who do you still remember from that day where they were seated? Were they all there? How did that go? And, yeah. Uh, yeah. There were actually eight of them because uh, Antonin Scalia had just died um, not long before that. Gorsuch had been appointed, but he hadn't started yet. So it was just the eight of them. Uh, so we had um, Chief Justice Roberts, uh, we had Kennedy, um, uh, Breyer, uh, Sotomayor, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, of course, uh, Kagan, I'm missing one. <laughs> Clarence Thomas and I mean, Clarence uh, Thomas was there. And you, you also had, uh, um, oh goodness, the other, the other arch conservative who, who, who's, who was there. Um, I'm, I'm forgetting one. But anyway, you had them all there, and you were, you were, you were there, and and experiencing all this. The court case name changed, right? The court, the the name was Lee versus Tam, and then it changed to McCall versus Tam. So explain who Lee and McCall. So uh, Lee, uh, Michelle K. Lee was the director of the UNES United States Patent and Trademark Office, and she was kind of in charge at the time when our case was going up. But what ended up happening was, um, you know, our case was argued two days before um, Trump uh, received the inauguration ceremony to, to become president. And so during the transition of his administration stepping in, um, there was turnover at the trademark office. So um, Michelle Lee stepped down, and the interim director at the time uh, was a guy, guy named by um, Joseph Mattel. And so he stepped in and because he was the direct acting director when the court issued the opinion, they changed the name because it was just the director versus me essentially. And I mean, he, he had a choice, right? Could he have stopped it there or was it too late? Could he have it said, was, it was I don't wanna be in this fight. I don't want my name to be associated <laughs> with something that's that I don't believe in. If he felt that way, could he have done that? Yeah, uh, it was too late that that ship had sailed. He basically inherited the case because it the, I mean, all the arguments were done, everything had been filed. It was too late to withdraw. What I found out later from one of his colleagues, because I actually spoke at his alma mater, was that he was actually a supporter of our side of things. <laughs> um, but that's kind of what happens. And, and same thing with some of the people involved at the trademark office. They're like, well, it's kind of our job. We, we have to defend this law whether we kind of believe in it or not because that's our job and so it there's a lot of ironies with with this particular thing and and i know there were a lot of folks who were concerned because they thought oh you know they thought maybe my case would be one to kind of be the floodgate for hate speech that all kinds of awful things would be registered as trademarks and and that it would actually be very damaging to people of color but it happened uh, what's that? Has that happened? No. Um, th there were, you know, out of the 300,000 trademarks that were registered the following year, about 11 were kind of controversial or so-called disparaging. But when you actually look down into the details, they were all filed by people of color who were reappropriating um, terms to kind of bring on more nuanced discussions. And in particular, they were mostly from artists and small business owners, which is what I've been saying all along, that we needed the equal footing. Because, you know, if you think about it, this law was written in the height of the, of the Jim Crow era. It wasn't written to protect people like us. And, you know, I was not the only person who was considered too Asian to register the mark. Uh, every single uh, person from various backgrounds, uh, whether they're LGBTQ or other people of color, other racial ethnic groups, they all try and reappropriate things. That's something that artists do all the time. But whenever a person of color applied, they were swiftly rejected. Yet um, applicants who have a different race oftentimes kind of got the benefit of the doubt. So that's why every single racial slur you could think of was a registered trademark um, like on the books. But whenever Asian people applied, we were we were denied, just like me. All right, we have so much to talk to Simon about, including his tips on being a speaking superstar. You can see how great he communicates here. And he's he's done 13 
TEDx talks. I've only done five, so I've got a long way to go to catch up to him. It's a world record. <laughs> it's not a competition, Ed. You certainly uh, have quite a master. You're a great great speaker. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. So we're going to get some of his tips in a few minutes, but let's go through the comments that are coming in. Berklin says, thank you, Simon Tam. And um, uh, he's saying, uh, be why science, music, art, and emotion combine to see what is right and what is wrong. James Baroud says, uh, hi. <laughs> and um, Berklin says, if this is not clear enough, then what is a crime? He's talking about the name, I guess. And to see that we didn't get the end of the story, though I should have, I shouldn't have, uh, you know, forced you to stop. So, by the way, Samuel Alito, we want to make sure yes. we shout out the arch conservative on the court. Uh, he, uh, along with Clarence Thomas, uh, are the extreme right wing position on the court now. Uh, so, what happens? The they they go through many cases and then many verdicts and then come to your judgments. Is that what's what's the right terminology? And then they yeah. come to you. They, so they issue their opinion, but they don't do it that day. Uh, they do it many, many months later. And right. what ends up happening is like the more controversial or kind of high profile cases, the court tends to save for summer or like towards the end of the term. So every Monday and Wednesday, which are the days of the week where they issue opinions, I would get up at six in the morning and I'd, I'd jump on Twitter, I'd look at the news and be like, what, what do they say? Uh, finally on June 19th, 2017. So, you know, coincided with Juneteenth, actually. Uh, I wake up, my my phone is blown up. I had 700 missed notifications. I'm like, I guess something happened. I checked Twitter and Oregon Public Broadcasting, uh, the NPR affiliate in, in Oregon, which is actually the first national media that broke the story about the Asian American that, a band that was defying stereotypes um, they wrote in a single tweet, the Supreme Court rules in favor of the slants. And, you know, later that day, I found out that decision was was unanimous. Every single justice signed on. And um, what a feeling uh, of relief, because it was finally over. <laughs> Tell us about the expenses that you had to go through. Uh, how did you, some of it was, I, I, I hope, paid for by folks, and talk about that. Um, so. The legal team generously had been working pro bono for, for the majority of the time. So that was taken care of. Um, but there's a, uh, you know, I had to take care of the hard legal fees, court fees and that kind of thing. And for folks who aren't aware, um, the government likes doing things a very, very certain way. And if you don't follow that way, you're, you kind of get in trouble. But one of those ways is they have very particular printers that they like to use. You have to use something called an appellate printer so that all the documents in a particular format that process is not cheap i mean i would get bills of tens of thousands of dollars for for printing and um so it was extremely brutal i i took on a job after job had side hustles in fact that was one of the reasons why i started traveling as a speaker because i i knew that was a way i could generate some income um i i had to actually step down from being a full-time musician to pay for the legal bills to fight this particular case. So uh, that's kind of how it all happened. And then it wasn't until that we got to the Supreme Court that a foundation helped take care of some of the more arduous, uh, and more difficult uh, legal bills that were just like placing that burden. But uh, a lot of it was on credit cards and some of them I just paid off like fairly recently. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, just oh, wow. years and years, uh, I, you know, it, the thing is, if, if I didn't have the generosity of the, the, the law firms that, that supported me and uh, groups like the ACLU and Cato Institute and all these other organizations, uh, the case probably would have cost in excess of one or two million dollars just to fight. Amazing. Did you ever give, think of giving up or quitting? All the time. <laughs> all the, all, I mean, how, how could I not? Like it, I, it was, it cost me everything. Um, you know, it, not only did I have to walk away from my band for a period of time, cause I couldn't afford to be a musician anymore. I had band members and some of my closest friends walk away because they just, they're like, they said, we signed up to be in a band, not to be in this lawsuit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, I was just constantly thinking about it. And, and in fact, the most difficult time is, um, as we're approaching the federal court and it just, the, the, expenses are just getting so much and just all the printing fees were just kind of staggering. I, I started skipping meals. I just said, you know, I can only afford to eat like 
seven meals a week. I had to <laughs> basically drop uh, two thirds of my uh, ability to eat because I just couldn't afford it anymore. And um, you know that that was it was really difficult. It was very really tough for my family, like my parents, to kind of see me go through this experience. In fact, um, you know, the day that I got the decision, when I phone calls and everything were pouring in, I'll never forget that in the middle of that day, I, I called my mom and she, she's like, oh, you know, she tells me in manner, she's like, going, she going, she's like, congratulations. Um, you know, I heard that, that you won. And I was like, yeah, I, I finally won. And she's just like, good. I hope you can be happy. I hope you, I can see you smile again. And I was like, what do you mean? And she's just like, well, you used to just always be so happy. You used to always see you joking around. But like, I, I want my son back. And so I hope now that it's over, I can have my son back. And it was just, I mean, heartbreaking. I didn't even realize like the toll it was taking and, and how how much it was just sucking out parts of my soul to like fight this thing. But, you know, in the end, I, I, I just realized like, it, it's still worth it. And, and, you know, I actually spend a lot of time speaking at law conferences and to legal groups and, and law students in particular are interested in that. And they're always like, how much did it cost? How much did it cost? And I'm like, you know, the real cost of doing what's right or the cost of following your dreams is not actually what you have to sacrifice in order to chase those dreams and to follow your values. The real cost is what you pay when you don't like have integrity and you don't actually follow your dreams. And so I, I realized this, I had to keep going because like I knew I had a chance to make a difference. I saw how the law was impacting people, especially people of color. How could I walk away from that? And so I, that's why I kept pressing forward no matter what it took. I knew I had to do something to highlight the um, inequitable law and to highlight the importance of allowing freedom of expression and for artists in particular. Well, thank you for doing that. We are so glad that you uh, were able to see that through. Now, we, we don't have a lot of time left, but we have lots of comments and questions and all of that that I want to show you. Uh, and uh, 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 let's see, Yois says, Strive Together sounds amazing. That's your new organization that you're going to, uh, you're already working there, but you're moving from Nashville to Cincinnati for, and uh, uh, this is great. So you can say you're already doing your, your promotional work for them. <laughs> Uh, he also saw the film that I that my sponsor uh, had, and he said it's it's waterworks. He watched it a good film. He says, and uh, Digital Night says have a good show. And Fernando uh, wasn't sure if you guys were real. I guess the slants were real. And then says, wow, I remember that NPR interview, the first one. And then of course when you were when you won the case, Mark is watching from Durham, North Carolina. And um, for those of you who just who are just joining us, we're talking to Simon Tam who's a musician, activist, and he has a name on a Supreme Court case that went all the way to the Supreme Court and he won uh, the, the right to appropriate a name that was used by bullies his whole life. And now they're able, their, their band's name, The Slants, is something that uh, he has probably reappropriated as we see a lot of artists and musicians doing. Let's talk for a second about the Washington football team and what's going on there. Just this week, they announced that It'll be just called the Washington football team until yeah. they come up with a name because it is hard to kind of, they had, you know, 10 years of attention on this. And Daniel Schneider, who is known as someone who is uh, is not at all interested in, 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 in changing this, yeah. uh, was forced to. And this is one of the side effects and positive side effects of the killing of George Floyd, this awareness of the importance of treating everyone better. We're seeing that... Uh, and 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 it's it's this is the only reason that we're in that position because as recently as two years ago they said they would not be changing the name and they're changing the name. So uh, uh, tell me about what you understand of the case of the Washington Football Team, and then I want to get your tips on public speaking like a rock star. Here is a photograph from the time uh, you and I did a workshop on rock the mic, and uh, there you are. People can see me, but there you're you're sitting down in this photograph. These are pictures from our friend Stefan Kaplan at Spin It Social, and these were some of the tips you were giving. So this is just a preview. We'll come back to you to give us these particular tips, but uh, let's 
uh, uh, give us your sense of what's going on with the Washington football team, which of course is known as the Redskins for so many years. And now finally they have, are dropping the name. Yeah, I mean, they're finally changing their name and it's all thanks to the proactive work of, uh, and per very persistent work of a number of Native American activists and, and their allies. So for a long time, there have been a number of strategies that were developed to try and get the team to change their name. Uh, some of it was a public awareness. So you, there were there were football commercials that kind of said that like, basically were saying like the, how calling it out for what it was, a racial slur. And there was also another lawsuit that paralleled mine. So a um, number of activists tried to sue the team to try and get them to cancel, get the trademark office to cancel the team's registration. Uh, ultimately, that would have proven to be kind of more of a symbolic victory because had the government canceled their trademarks, the team would not have been um, forced or inclined to change their name. In fact, they would still have their trademark protections. And ultimately, uh, that lawsuit failed because of, you know, in large part because of my case and then another case after mine called Inray Brunetti, uh, where they struck down all aspects of, uh, of the Lanham Act that were basically on the, on the premise that they were viewpoint discrimination. That being said, the conversations continued in the most important places in the marketplace. And when, as you mentioned, there has been this huge wave of uh, conversations around racial justice started bubbling up, especially in the last month, two months, um, in, in kind of a broader level, companies were compelled to provide statements of how they supported Black Lives Matter or diversity inclusion. And the team's major sponsors, um, Nike and FedEx in particular, basically threatened to pull all their money. And that's when the team realized that Oh, money talks, and they wanted to basically uh, make sure that they could appease the sponsors. So they decided to have that conversation to finally change the name. And so, uh, you know, I'm I'm thrilled to see that happen, and I'm I'm so glad to see it happening in, with that in a way that doesn't involve the government. Because I think if we give the government the power to kind of uh, make those decisions, uh, we'll probably find ourselves in situations that we don't necessarily want uh, where someone else has that sense of power and controlling what we get to say is right or wrong and so um, like many places like the the marketplace of ideas ultimately won out and um, you know i i, lo I love quoting um, dr martin luther king jr who also uh, oftentimes would appropriate this quote from thomas polar he said the moral arc of the universe is long but it bends towards justice and I always remind folks that, you know, that, that moral arc doesn't bend on its own. It requires patience, it requires persistence, and it requires people who not only understand their rights, but who are willing to fight for them, no matter what that cost might be. And you have lived those words and you really, as you were speaking, by the way, I was thinking about those words, about the moral arc of justice. That's something that Obama used to, President Obama used to always. I, I think he was in, a, in the old office at the time. I think he had the, the words uh, engraved somewhere. But it's so true. And uh, for, for my friends who, who had been fighting so long to kind of change that mascot, mascot I'm just so thrilled for them because I know it was a really long, heartbreaking um, journey. And, and many of those activists receive death threats and, and, and constant threats of violence to them and their family. I mean, they really just put their lives on the line because they of the same kind of ideas of dignity. Like they just wanted the right to decide for themselves what was right and not have someone else say, oh, this is an honorific, when in fact, they didn't feel that way at all. And, and as you know, it was run by a racist actually had put that, that name on, on, on the team in the first place. And that was one of the things, I, I've seen it with my own eyes. On Monday on the show, we had a conversation with a young woman who was looking at changing the name of some of the products inside Trader Joe's, you know, they have this yeah. Trader Arabian Joe and Trader Joe San and Trader Jose. And of course, some people laugh it off as, uh, as, as people will. But this young girl, you know, she's 17 years old. She, uh, she started a petition and with only 2,000, 3,000 signatures, Trader Joe's came out and said, we are working on it. So we got this. Don't worry about it. Right. So that means they have given up and saying, OK, we'll change it. But that wasn't good enough for all these bullies like all these racists come out and say why are you you're the racist by pointing this out no one else is complaining and it went on and on and on so i couldn't and i was getting some of that blowback because i had her on this show and this is not you know 
it's not like putting her on CNN or something. Yeah. So I can imagine what her life must have been like or what your life was like when you fight for moral justice or for things of great clarity, there are people who will fight you for no reason, even after the company agreed. So there are now people, we see them online, who are such devoted fans of this racist name, the Redskins, who are willing to fight to keep that name, even when the team, which is run by a guy who didn't care and who loved the name in the first place, he's agreed, and they're they're more, you know, they're bigger defenders of this than uh, than the the team itself. It's so hard to understand. Uh, we have uh, you know only a little bit left. I do want to take advantage of your being here, uh, uh, sharing some of your thoughts on uh, being a great public speaker as you are. Uh, so first, tell us what's under that jacket that you're wearing on screen. Uh, what are we looking at? What does that say? If you open that jacket, what would it say underneath? It says uh, Chinatown swagger. And it's actually a phrase from a, an incredible documentary called Nine Man uh, about um, this sport that's played in the courts of New York City. So oh. I just, it, I, and it, I just love the phrase. I just, it, it just, I was like, oh, this really kind of embodies my spirit. <laughs> I like that. And so let's, what we'll do is we, we have four photos here from our friend, uh, Stefan Kaplan. So we'll, let's just, instead of get, trying to get you to do everything, talk a little bit about your best tips and speak to the three, the three other photographs. But let's remind people, this was a show, uh, a workshop that you and I ran. Joey Chen was also there, the great CNN anchor. And uh, she did a, a session on interviewing and you did the session on public speaking like a rock star by a rock star in your case. Uh, so set this up for us and then let's walk through the other three photographs. I think, uh, you know, what a rock star is known for, passion, energy, and a performance, and of course, an unparalleled ability to captivate an audience. And I think those are the qualities of any great speaker. You gotta be able to connect with an audience and you gotta use your passion to do it. So a lot of my ideas about public speaking don't necessarily come from public speaking courses. They come from um, performing as a musician, like you, you know, being able to do it with authenticity, being able to do it in a way that uh, that people where the people can't help but watch what's happening or can't help but listening. So that's kind of how I got started in this whole thing. And the irony, of course, is I when I took public speaking in college a uh, number of years ago. I thought it was the worst experience ever. I was like, I'm never gonna do this. <laughs> and here I am now um, doing it all the time, whether it's at, in person. Um, you know, last year I did 180 events. I, I released a memoir uh, about my life experiences. So I was touring the circuit and bookstores and conventions. And now, of course, we're doing a lot of these virtual kinds of events. But uh, that's where a lot of those ideas come from. All right, so let's look at Find your purpose. So I believe that people should be driven by their values. And uh, more than anything else, when you, it's kind of like Simon Sinek's idea of like, start with why. Figure out the things that drive you, your inner self. Um, that ultimately moves the needle more than anything else. Instead of focusing on the what or the hot, um, the kind of hows of doing things, like focus on that why. And so for folks who are interested in doing like a TED talk or TEDx talk, like figure out why is it that you wanna get that message out? If your sole reason for getting on a TED stage is because you want attention, then I oftentimes say you've already failed. Like figure out what it is that you're trying to create in terms of change in the world and use that, use that value to, to motivate you. And I think that will actually ultimately change how you speak and how you connect with folks because they'll be able to see much more of an authentic passion behind your ideas. Thank you, Simon. Uh, we've got two more. So let's go, let's go to, uh, let's go to those. The sec uh, the next one is five, the best ideas ignite. So this is kind of like Seth Godin's idea that the best ideas will, will win. Um, that, and that in this case, they will spark that conversation and they'll spark something in other people. Uh, you know, I think great ideas should not be held on to uh, for ourselves, but they should be used as a way to actually spark change in the world. And I believe that folks who have that idea, that idea that's worth sharing, if, if you were to use uh, Ted's phrase, is one that actually get people to think and reflect and maybe even change some kind of behavior in the hearts. And that certainly works. And one more, the best ideas win. 
at the end of the day, I mean, I'm a free speech act advocate. I believe that, you know, when you want to counter hate, the best method of doing so isn't censorship. It is providing better ideas, more nuanced ideas, ideas driven by compassion and love in this world, because that is how you win in terms of a long-term sustainable and, and creating long-term sustainable change in this world. And that's so great. We should also point out how great your graphics are and you don't fill your screen with text. Talk about that as a speaking device or a speaking methodology. Well, I'm like, if, if you're a public speaker, you want people to pay attention to you, not your slides. <laughs> like, if people are reading a screen, they have a hard time listening to the speaker. So I just try and condense things down as much as possible. Uh, also, as you can see, I wear like very thick glasses. I have trouble seeing. So if I'm like in the back row and I can't tell what's going on, you're already losing me. So I'm like, you know, I, I've already been PowerPointed to death so many times, especially in college with, you know, bullet point after bullet point. We don't need that. We just need some kind of image that is supporting that idea so that people hang on to the words you say. I love that. So hang on to the words you say rather than try to decipher what's on the screen. I think that's yeah way for us to think about this. If you're gonna put everything you're gonna say on the screen, they can just go out and have the PDF or the, a copy of the slide deck sent to them. You know, that's the funny thing when I do like legal training, it's part of the requirement that they get the copy of the slide deck. And I'm always like, you can have it, but it's not it <laughs> good. Like it's it's not gonna mean anything. All right. <laughs> okay. uh, we, we, we have such little time left. I wanted to walk through a couple of photographs that we uh, we've uh, we have of you and tell us about this moment, this day in your life. Uh, well, one of the best moments I've ever had. This was uh, this was my wedding day. Um, I, I got to marry this amazing, beautiful, talented artist, Faina Laura, and so that's us walking through the uh, Lansu Chinese Gardens in Portland, Oregon. Beautiful. Look at that, and it's a beautiful day. And you uh, and uh, look at this very dramatic. This looks like from a movie scene. Who are these guys? Those are my groomsmen, uh, and they're all connected to me via my band. The The gentleman on my right is Alex, who's my publicist, who, who's been supporting my work since 2006. Um, to my left are Jonathan and Tyler, two very long-standing members in the slants. Excellent. And uh, let's take a look. Yeah, these, these are beautiful pictures. Let's give a shout out to the photographer, if you remember. Oh, thank you. Uh, this is uh, Britta Marie was the, the photographer for the wedding. Nice. These are great pictures. You you obviously have understood how to package, you know, you, you've you got great content, but you also have to use images. Tell me about the power of images and the work you do um, as a musician. You know, you're, you're used to performing, speaking and, on big stages. Uh, where does where does performance and art and images all combine? Where do they combine? Well, I like to say that you try and get people to engage on a multiple, uh, with multiple senses. And obviously, since so many people are actually visual learners, they, they take in information uh, just as a gut reaction based on imagery. So that's why I love using bold, dramatic imagery, uh, both in terms of how I portray my band, but also when, when I speak and use slide decks, because like people can get so much more information and, and perhaps it's even information that you're just trying to get out there to um, to lead to a much bigger point of what you're trying to do. So uh, imagery is so, so much a part of that, just like speaking and hearing and feeling and touching and so on. And this is, of course, that day at the Supreme Court. And that looks like uh, another memorable day for you. Uh, we, before we just say, uh, say goodbye, I, I want to tell people that I really do want to play music from uh, Simon, but one of the things we've discovered, Simon, is that even if I have the musician on with us, the way YouTube and Twitter and Facebook and all deal with music copyright, they keep dinging us, even when we have permission. From yeah, the musician, it's not always, it's not always, it's not always your permission, right? Because you, it's not, you don't have, I mean, you, you might, but not all musicians have copyright to their music. And so these, during the pandemic, Facebook and uh, YouTube told us that because machines are now in charge instead of people, uh, we won't be able to override some of the machine uh, copyright claims. So watch out, and that's been that's turned out to be the case. Even when we're we're perform we're producing shows like this with uh, lots of musicians, and we've run into that issue. Uh, I could have probably gotten away with having you here, but the machines don't care, isn't it? You know what? They tag it on my band's own channel, like oh, I, sure. I get flagged, and they're like, "This is." I'm like, 
it's mine. I, here's the copy of the copyright, but it, the machine doesn't read that. So it right. takes me months and months sometimes to get my own music videos online. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I, I want everybody to go to the slants.com and listen to your music, purchase your music, go to Spotify and listen wherever. Uh, uh, just remind us, where is it that musicians make the, are doing kind of making the most money when people go online? Is it on Pendle or at least, least bad in terms of the deals for you? Bad. Yeah. Buying, isn't it true like buying a full album on iTunes is still the best? Um, and then it goes down and down from there. Am I wrong? It depends on the musician. So if they have a Bandcamp page, that usually goes directly to the to the musician. And during this time period, Bandcamp is actually waiving all of their fees, so musicians get a hundred percent of the proceeds. Nice. In terms of like my band, I would just ask folks like. Uh, rather than giving to us, give to uh, our nonprofit. It's tax deductible, and you, we get to help support other up and coming musicians who are oh. creating work. So um, they can do that at the slants.org. That's the, the foundation website. The slants.org. So definitely check that out. Uh, Simon, I'm going to let you go. Uh, uh, one of the things that I, I, we are doing today is one of my friends, by the way, is in Singapore, and, they, and um, I. Well, I'm, I'm after as soon as this is done, I'm going to jump over there to uh, to say hello to him and wish him a happy birthday. But uh, tell us what's on your pin right there, on your lapel. Well, well this is a it's a book cover. This is actually a, an illustration someone made of Harry Potter with Hedwig, the his owl. So, oh, okay. very cool. Uh, when do you leave for, in the books. <laughs> when do you leave for Cincinnati? Uh, in about two weeks. So it's coming up very, very quick, and uh, I can't wait. And what's the how's the, how long is the drive from Nashville? It's about four hours. Okay. So it's not too okay. bad. That's not bad at all. Uh, we wish you the very best. Please stay safe through all the COVID and everything else. And uh, your energy, your positivity is so inspiring to me. Every time we've met, whether it's in a small setting, the way we were at that workshop, or on that giant stage with thousands of people with us as we were at that uh uh, event at uh, Duquesne University in uh, it was there were Martin Barron from the uh, Washington uh, from the Washington Post, Dean Baquet from the New York Times, uh, uh, all kinds of folks were there. Uh, left, yeah. right. Also, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg joined us by video. That's and, right. That's yeah. right. It was it's, it was quite the day and uh, really inspiring. And I was thrilled to see you perform in front of all of us as you you gave a kind of uh, talk and performance at the same time. I don't do the one video of it. I will share it because it was quite it was quite well done as always. Thank you, Simon the Tam at Simon the Tam. Please follow him, and we wish you the very best. I'll, if you're up for it, we'll have you back to talk about Strive together once you're settled in down the road in Cincinnati. So thanks very much, Simon. All right, thanks so much. Okay, bye bye. What a great guy, folks. Please follow him at Simon the Tam and check out the slants.com and the slants.org. You saw when I said, how can people support him and his band? He said, support the foundation instead. What a great guy. Simon the Simon, he's not Simon the Tam, he's at Simon the Tam. Simon Tam, great guy and a, a wonderful inspiration for all of us. How many of us can do all that he did and fight through all that he did in becoming uh, someone who had his court case won at the Supreme Court and bending that moral arc of justice. Okay, as always, before we go, we want to thank everyone who's watching and also to um, to do something that we have been doing on this show because Kimberly Crenshaw, the professor who coined the term intersectionality, told me to do so when I asked what can allies do to support black folks. She said, say their names. And so we're going to do that in just a minute. And uh, we want to thank all of you for joining us and want to remind you of what's coming up on this show uh, tomorrow night. Jamie Metzel will be here. Jamie will be here for our positivity night. If you thought Simon was a positive guy, you wait till you see Jamie positive and energetic, just like Simon. And uh, we do that every Sunday. I'm always looking for speaker ideas, folks. Let us know. We're well past 250 speakers on the show and we have no plans to, uh, to stop. So that's tomorrow night. And then on uh, Monday, we go back to Portland for Portland in Crisis. We'll meet 
the publisher of The Scanner, a leading African-American newspaper in Portland. And we will hear about the unprecedented turmoil caused by the federal government, caused by the president of the United States that's happening there. We have other great shows coming up this week that you won't want to miss. Make sure you email me, Sri at Sri.net, so we can uh, hear from you uh, as well. Uh, and then tomorrow morning, 8.30 a.m. Eastern, Anthony De Palma will be here for my New York Times read-along. We read the New York Times out loud like crazy people for five years on Facebook Live. 22-year New York Times reporter and foreign correspondent will be here. And then at 11 a.m., I am honored to co-executive produce with my friends, Dr. Sujana and Dr. Marina. She's on call, a new show that will have an entire show dedicated to opening of schools. And Dr. Heather Kloss, an infectious diseases doctor, will be here. Dr. Sally Goza, the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And Donna Mazik will be here, registered nurse and executive director of the National Association of School Nurses. Now, let us say their names. We were at first saying their names through this image that you see on the left, the cover of Time Magazine by Titus Kaffer, and on the right, a photograph you may not have seen of a young George Floyd with his mother, Larcinia Floyd. She would die two years almost to the day before he was killed in Minneapolis. They're both now buried next to each other in Houston. And here are the names mentioned in the updated version of the Say Her Name report. Brianna Taylor, killed by police in her bed on March 13, 2020. A Tatiana Jefferson, Charlena Siobhan Lyles, Corin Gaines, India Kager, Sandra Bland, Alexia Christian, Maya Hall, Megan Hockaday, Janisha Fonville, Natasha McKenna, Tanisha Anderson, Aura Rosser, Shanique Proctor, Michelle Cousseau, Pearlie Golden, Gabriela Navarez, Yvette Smith. Before I read the second column, think about how many of those names have you heard? Sure, Brianna Taylor, Sandra Bland, but have you heard these other names? Renisha McBride, Miriam Carey, Kaim Livingston, Kayla Moore, Shelley Fry, Melissa Williams, Shulena Weldon, Alicia Thomas, Chantel Davis, Charmel Edwards, Rekia Boyd, Cherise Francis, Ayana Stanley Jones, Tarika Wilson, Katherine Johnston, Alberta Spruill, Kendra James, Latanya Haggerty, Margaret Laverne Mitchell, Taisha Miller, Danette Daniels, Frankie Ann Perkins, Sanji Taylor, Eleanor Bumpers. Again, how many of those names have you heard? The fight for social justice, the, site, the fight against police brutality continues. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for your feedback and suggestions of this for the show. Please email me, sri at sri.net. If you would like to collaborate on an episode or a series, please let us know. And now let's thank our sponsors once again. Muckrack Academy, Fundamentals of Social Media, free certification course, mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social. Also, none believable, divinely delicious cookies on a mission. Each box of handcrafted cookies provides two meals to those in need. 20% off with the code SREE, -E, SREE -E at nonbelievable.com, divinely delicious cookies on a mission. And Hot Star Premier Nights. Watch the year's biggest blockbuster streaming straight to your screen, exclusively on Hot Star. Hot Star Premiere Night kicked off this weekend with the world premiere of the new film Dil Bechara, starring the late Shushant Singh Rajput, with new music from Oscar winner A.R. Rahman, streaming free on the platform right now. Hot Star brings you the newest Indian movies with subtitles, plus entertainment, cricket, live news channels, and more. Hotstar.com slash US. Please check them out. And thank you all for being here. We appreciate you so much.